Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Merit Sukovich from the Healy Center at Mass General. I'm here today uh, with uh, Allison and Catherine, who are our patient navigators uh, that hopefully many of you know, and Sabrina Paganoni, who's the co-principal uh, investigator of the Healy platform. And also Molly, um, who's helping us with arrange uh, slides, and then Marianne Chase, who leads our, our um, project management team at the Healy Center. So um, good to see a lot of familiar uh, names, uh, faces, and some new people. Um, as uh, we do on the other ones, I'm just going to give a little update of where we are on the platform trial, um, try to cover some new topics, and then leave uh, uh, time for questions. Um, so uh, maybe uh, uh, next slide. Uh, so, to, so I hope uh, many of you have been coming to our um, our special sessions where we have the companies that are the first four drugs in the platform trial talk about their science. We've done two of them so far, and the recordings are up on our website, the Healy Center, if you missed it. Uh, they were really good and really great questions, and we have two more coming up. Um, we'll give a little uh, update on our sites and enrollment and how to stay in touch with us. And I really just want to, again, thank uh, so many of you who are part of the study and are making it a, a reality that we can really accelerate how we find treatment for people with ALS. Uh, next slide, please. So just to recap for people who are new, the platform trial idea is, is uh, a one that we um, stole from cancer. Uh, it's been already uh, used there to really speed up drug development when you have a big pipeline. And it can cut down the time to getting effective treatments in half, really increases the proportion of people who are on active drug, and it, and it also cuts the cost. So we started with four drugs, um, and we call them regimen A, B, C, and D. And each of the um, regimens, there's 160 people who are um, participating, 120 uh, get active drug and 40 get placebo. We pull those placebo data so that at the end of the 24 weeks, we can compare everybody on active drug, let's say to Zalucaplan, the first one, to everybody who was on placebo on the other arm. And that's where you get the efficiencies. Also, when we want to add a new drug, we just amend the protocol and you can add a new drug very quickly. So if there's new science or something new that's coming out, we can add that quickly. The other uh, really positive thing of this approach is that um, you know when we're done with the first, let's say three or four regimens, we'll get answers to all of them at the same time. Uh, we also, for all the regimens, uh, require um, the companies provide an open label extension. And what that means is that they provide the drug for uh, really up until we know the results, which could be six months, uh, 12 months, depending on when someone starts. Um, and so at the end of 24 weeks, if you were on the active drug, you continue on the active drug in the open label extension. If you were on placebo for the 24 weeks, you switch to the active drug. So everybody gets access to the experimental treatment after the 24 weeks. Next slide, please. Um, so we do have 42 sites actively enrolling now. This is a big bump up from our last update. And we um, we are trying to get to all 54. COVID has made things challenging for many centers around hiring and having staffing. But uh, we're very excited to have 42. Um, and if you uh, want to find a site near you, um, there's a map on our website. And you can also call uh, Catherine or Allison and we'll give you their contact information. And they, they've really been helping people find sites close to them. Next slide. So this is a list of the sites. The four new ones that we added since our last uh, meeting are down in blue, the University of Missouri. I think on this call, we've had some questions about when we were gonna open a site in Missouri. So I'm happy to say that we have. Um, University of Minnesota, John Hopkins in Baltimore, and the University of California in Irvine. So some uh, real progress there. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, 323 people have signed up for the platform trial today, which is just amazing. Um, so that, that's people who've given consent to be part of it. Of those 323, um, 257 have already been assigned to one of the treatment regimens, either A, B, C, or D. And then um, 217 are already started on the active drug. So there's some time between each of these when we look for safety. Uh, but of course, we try to get people onto the investigational product as quickly as possible. So it's, it's going well. Um, we, obviously, there's a lot of uh, challenges right now with the with the pandemic for people getting to sites and travel, but uh, everybody's doing the best they can, and uh, this is enrolling very well. So thank you. I mean, the faster we enroll, the faster we get the results of the trial. We do have, because sometimes on this calls, people have asked us about eligibility, and we do have uh, all the um, eligibility for being part of the platform trial on this uh, link here. Again, we'll post these slides. 
Um, but again, we tried to be as open um, uh, for enrollment in this platform trial as possible and still get um, uh, an answer about whether the drug works or not at 24 weeks. Uh, next slide, please. So I, I introduced at the beginning our patient navigators, Catherine Small and Allison Bulat. This is how you can reach them by phone or by email. Uh, they're talking to lots of people, so please reach out to them. And I actually wanted to maybe stop for a minute and ask uh, Catherine or Allison about maybe some of the most frequent questions they're getting and maybe you want to share some of the answers here. Yeah, sure. So um, I know Allison has a question to bring up as well, but one of the things I've been um, hearing from people a lot in the past couple of weeks is related to drug access. So I know we've been saying for the first three drug regimens in the trial, we're expecting the results at about the same time. And people are wondering if they're assigned to one of those regimens and then the results show that one of those investigational products is effective or shows promise, um, you know, what are the logistics of drug access at that point? Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, let's say you're in regimen A and then we find out that regimen A is effective. And the people who are uh, in the open label extension often um, you know, the companies will expand, extend that open label extension so that um, you continue to get um, access to the drug until they go through their FDA filing um, and get market approval. Um, depending on the results, like if it's really robust uh, results and you know, the FDA thinks it's enough to file, then um, often companies will do um, a much larger expanded access and provide it globally while they're working on um, the approvals. So there's, there's, there's um, a little bit of unknown until you see the results and how, how robust they are. But we're committed to like any drug that works to really uh, working with the industry partners to making it available as broadly as possible. And I'm hoping that more than one works, but I think again, the beauty of this is we get answers much faster. We'll get answers to three and then shortly after we'll get answers to the fourth one. Thank you, Merit. Um, one of the things I hear a lot about as we're all interested in the timing is, do you have any advice for patients who are debating whether to start or stop exclusionary medications in the interest of becoming part of the trial. So for example, at what part of the enrollment process does that become an important consideration for them? Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, again, we try to be as, as inclusive as we can, but um, the general principle for any trial is, is that um, if there's a treatment, whether it's a supplement or a drug that's in another trial for ALS, then that would be exclusionary. And sometimes in ALS, those are those include um, supplements, uh, you know, like curcumin is in a trial. So the best thing is to do it, um, you know, 30 days before you would come in for your screening visit for the platform trial. And that would be something that you could discuss, obviously, with um, you guys, Catherine and, and Allison, but, uh, but um, your site um, to, to work out that timing. Um, but usually uh, for any drug, it's about a 30 day washout. Okay. Thank you. Uh, maybe in the next slide, please. Um, so just um, a reminder that these weekly uh, webinars really came uh, as a suggestion from our patient advisory committee who we're meeting with uh, shortly in February. I'm sure we'll get other good ideas to bring forward to the community. Um, the schedule for them and how to register is found here. And then we do again record every one and put them up there. And uh, we have been doing the drug mechanisms and we have a few other ones planned based on your questions and feedback. We're going to have some statisticians and some regulatory people come and talk about trial design and uh, FDA approvals in, in, in our future calls. But the next one for a drug is February 18th. Uh, it's next week uh, by Biohaven uh, Regimen B and Verdipistat. And then February 25th, UCB uh, will come talk. And that's Regimen A about Salucapone. So I hope those have been helpful. Uh, next slide, please. So I think that's it. So I think we can open for questions. And uh, I think Sabrina, you're going to uh, moderate. Yes, uh, so far, we have received um, a question. And, and everyone, please uh, feel free to type uh, as we take the first question. Actually, the first question is about um, trial design. Uh, uh, so the, uh, the question is, um, we, um, tonight, you indicated that if you are on placebo, you can go on the active drug after the 24 week trial period. And so the question is, is this a change in policy? Because the, the person who wrote thought that a few weeks ago, we said that um, the, the, we wouldn't be able to, participants wouldn't be able to go on, uh, on active drug, but would be re-randomized. So perhaps we may want to explain the options. Oh, sure. Yes, so no change in policy. Uh, so from the beginning, when we designed this, 
we really insisted with our partners, industry partners, that they provide open label access to the people in the study after the 24 weeks. So people have that choice at the end of, let's say, regimen A, 24 weeks. If you want to go an open label extension, you can. Um, and that would be for up to a year um, uh, until we know the results. The, however, you also have a choice not to do that right? and then and to go back and re get randomized into another regimen. So the, the choice is there for, for patients. And obviously the, your, your local team and your doctors are the best people to talk about what might be best for you. Great. Then there's a question about COVID. Would the Healy platform trial considering uh, offering COVID vaccine to all participants? Well, if, if 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 we could, yes, but we but we can't really. I mean, first of all, as, as many know, that it's just not available, and, and each state is regulating how it how it goes. And for example, our state, it's, it's right now only given to people who are seventy five or older, um, and live in Massachusetts. So so that is something that we can't take on. I, I wish we could because I, I'd love everybody to be vaccinated, but it's something you should work on with your primary care doctor or your neurologist in your state, because I think almost every state is really almost all of them, is restricting it to residents of that state. Yeah, there's another question about uh, trial design. How can participants decide to go for open label extension without knowing if they were on placebo or active drug, or if the drug has any positive results uh, on that participant? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. So the science for the drug is just as good, if not better, you know, if there's been more science when you get to the open label as, as it was when you were um, at the beginning of the trial. So nothing's changed there. We still think they're good, good science and good rationale. Um, so if we thought that it was, uh, had a good reason to be in the trial in the first place, we also still think it is good reason to go into open label extension. We can't uh, let people know what they were on at that point for a couple of reasons. One is the FDA actually um, asked us uh, for that. And the reason is because um, they can use and we can use the data from the open label to see how people did who, let's say they were on placebo the first six months, who did when switching to it, as well as how people did who were on it the six months and later. You can collect really important safety data and efficacy data that then can be used for filing uh, to the FDA should your trial be positive, it, it gives you the possibility to be able to go forward with one study. So it's a really important part of the study. Um, but if you if you tell people what they're on, then you can't use that data. Um, but I, I think again, this is a conversation with your uh, with the neurologist that you that cares for you. Um, but I would say that the science is still great at, at that point. And also we have um, a safety monitoring board that's always looking at the data, like every three months. Um, and they're looking at safety, they're looking at equipoise, meaning is it, is it ethical to continue? So if, if there was a reason not to continue, we, we would be stopped or we would have information. Great. Another question, does the trial involve testing for familial ALS? So we do ask participants to, uh, to donate um, blood for DNA testing, and we are planning actually to do what's called whole genome sequencing. So, so find, look for all the known genes as well as any other undiscovered genes, um, because that might be really important for seeing how people react to the drug or, or um, efficacy. However, that's done at the end of the study, so we're, we're not providing um, real-time uh, genetic testing. But the good news is that's widely available now. And um, there are some um, places that are offering it for free for patients and uh, Niels has a program. So there's a lot of options to get that done um, at uh, either no cost or very low cost for patients. There is a question about uh, the drug uh, Zalucoplan. Uh, that's our regimen A drug. So the, the, the question is, can you explain the difference in the mechanism of action in two drugs that address the complement? So Zalucoplan's yeah. uh, drug and then in, another drug that's not in the platform trial, it's the, uh, manufactured by Alexion. It's another yeah. ALS trial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're both complement inhibitors and they both work on the same part of the complement pathway called C5. But they're different types of drugs. One is an antibody, a monoclonal antibody that's given intravenous. That's the um, Alexion one, um, and not taken every day. And the um, the one from UCB Ra is not an antibody. It is given every day uh, under the skin. So they have different um, uh, formulations and different um, pharmacokinetics, and um, but they do both work on the same target. Um, so you know, obviously, hopefully, they both work, but they, but they are slightly, slightly different. And I'll just say, we didn't pick one over the other. Uh, we, um, when we picked our drugs, 
um, it was voluntary for companies to apply to be picked. And uh, UCB did, or RA back then, did apply and Alexion did not. But we really liked the pathway and the science behind it. Great. Um, we got a question about peer-reviewed papers on the science of ELS. Are there any that are recommended reading? Any peer-reviewed papers? Oh, that, well, that, there's a lot. Um, that's a good question because I think every week there's like tons of papers coming out about, about ALS. So it's actually hard to keep up. But I think maybe what you're asking is there are nice reviews either about the science or the drugs. And there certainly are. And I think um, just so I don't misspeak, maybe we'll bring those back to the group next week. And we can uh, share a few uh, like reviews. There's a few good reviews of the mechanisms of action, the biology of ALS. There's some um, uh, trial design and outcome measures. We yeah. can, we can suggest that. And a few of them are available open access. So perhaps, you know, we can come up with a list and maybe uh, our patient navigators, if, if people reach out to them, they could also circulate the uh, a list. Yeah. Uh, another question about genetics. Will the results of the genetic tests uh, be shared with the participants after the trial? In these first, um, first four regimens that we did, we did not include a return of results option. And that was... Um, but we, we are in discussions about whether we can do that for the future ones. And the, the reason was um, a bit around logistics and, and cost um, because we, we really wanted to get this off the ground and we're trying to keep it as streamlined as possible. So we're not in this one, but there are ways to do that. Um, they're a little complicated, but definitely important. So we're, we're in discussions to add that for fifth and sixth and seventh. Okay, another question that just came in. My understanding is that each of the regimens undergo ongoing safety and efficacy evaluations to, to make sure they don't do any harm for decisions on whether the trial should continue. Are the current evaluations that each of the regimens of the platform trial uh, have had shown good safety and no adverse events so far? Yeah, we've had um, two DSMB meetings uh, where they had data and both times they told us that we can go okay go forward with no changes to the protocol. So that means in DSMB language that they didn't see any safety or any reason uh, not to continue. And, and those meetings happen every three months. Yeah. So there's a question about uh, mechanism of action and, and patient characteristics. So if a patient with VLS also has a history of an autoimmune disease, uh, like ankylosing spondylitis, for example, is there any theoretical basis to think they may respond better to a complement inhibitor? It's a really good question. I don't have a, a, a real answer to it. I, I do think that there is some overlap in, in autoimmune diseases in, in ALS. For example, there's a little more uh, thyroid disease in people with ALS. So it could be that a drug that works on the, the immune system for ALS might help in the other illness and vice versa, but we don't have a lot of data supporting that yet. And then Sabrina, if you have anything to add. No, no, I, no, I completely agree. It's a very good question, but at this time we, we don't have data to, um, to suggest uh, either way. All right, do you have any suggestions to get one's neurologist uh, or ALS clinic up to speed and interested in the platform trial and uh, ALS trials in general? I mentioned it to the neurologist at my clinic and got a mixed response. So obviously there are many aspects to treating ALS patients, uh, but I feel that um, ALS clinics need to be offering this information more to patients. Um, and so uh, essentially, you know, the comment is how do we uh, raise awareness for the trial and make people interested, ALS clinics interested? Yeah, no, I, I'm with you. And I'm really sorry that that, that happened. I don't, I think every ALS uh, center should offer um, trial options for their patients, as well as obviously the, the marketed treatment. Um, I think there's a couple ways. So we just did another call out to our Neil centers for to add more centers to the platform trial. And we, we have 31 more centers who've applied. If you wanna, um, the person who wrote that wanna send us the name of the site, we could do a personal outreach to them. Some of it is, is um, about really um, trying to inspire the, the people. And, and the other, I hate to say it, but it might be um, people kind of moving to another doctor. If, if you're not getting someone who's offering that, I don't, I think in today's day, um, that's not, that's not a great fail lesson. I hope I don't go to jail for saying that, but to say it. Great. So I think we took all the questions that we had so far, which is great. Um, 
so I don't know, Merit, if you have any other comments. I, I just wanted to get people's thoughts on some other topics. Um, what we were thinking to do is um, we have a really great statistician we work with who can explain things really well. And we thought we might have him come and talk about um, some of the questions people have asked here, like, like why, why can't you on blind at, at, uh, before open label or um, why, you know, why is this trial designed this way? Um, I, I think the more information we share with people, the, 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 the better uh, of understanding. So that was one topic. And just love to hear about any other topics people would like. Uh, to do. Great. So please uh, send them in. And in the in the interim, we got more questions. So the first question, uh, you mentioned that participants in a given regimen are not unblinded at the end of their double blind treatment. And, and the question is, uh, is the uh, HEALY team also remaining uh, blinded until the end of the open label extension? Um, uh, yes, so the Healy Center, uh, anyone that's, uh, that works on this it remains blinded as well. The only people who aren't uh, blinded are, are the, data, the people on that data safety monitoring board and the statistician that's providing them the report. Great. Then a question about the next round of drugs. Uh, are we going to um, uh, include uh, several of them or are we going to allow drugs in one by one? I think uh, I think the platform works well when there's a couple of drugs, but but sometimes it's not uh, when it's not so easy to perfectly time them all to start at the same time. So we do have two companies we're working with, um, uh, what we call regimen E and F, and we're hoping they'll start around the same time. And we are certainly talking to a lot of other companies. So I think there might be times where maybe there's just one for a little bit, but the goal would be to always have at least three. Uh, there's a general question about updates on expanded access and expected rollout to sites. Yeah, so we're um, we're excited to roll this out. We have uh, we're working with um, two of the companies right now, Biohaven and Queens, to um, roll out their expanded access. One of them will be at three sites and one at two. So obviously, it won't be at all the sites. Um, and then we're also um, in discussions with Prolenia and UCB. Now, because these drugs are all um, relatively new in ALS. So these are the, the first ALS trials really we're doing with the drugs. Um, the companies are really doing small EAPs. So these are 30 patients, 20 patients. I think in the other stage, let's say like after a company has finished, but let's say after regimen A is done, and let's say it's positive, then there might be a large expanded access where you could go to all the centers and uh, hundreds of people. So because of where the drugs are in development, these are relatively small. But we hope to have at least five or six centers uh, by April doing expanded access. And then, you know, we're, we're with Rick Bedlack really doing a lot of education to sites because sites can do can also do it on their own and, and with other drug companies. So we want to really lay it out and make it easy for doctors to do this and offer this for their patients. Great. A question about the next round of drugs. Um, for the next round of drugs, will the current placebo data be combined with the placebo data that's going to be acquired in the next round? Yeah, that's the that's the goal. It it, it depends um, a little bit on on how that data looks, but as, assuming it's fairly constant, then yes, we can keep using it. Um, and we're in, in a lot of discussions with the FDA all about that and the statistics around it. But yes, that's the goal. Great. There's a couple of questions about sites. Uh, the question is whether there's any sites in the New York, New Jersey area. And so, yes, there are. Uh, and I think they are all on our website. Uh, and also you can contact the patient navigators to, to, to see that. And there's also several centers in California. Just wanted to quickly um, um, mention that to, to people who have been uh, typing. Um, there's a question about the new drug that we are going to include, the one from this from Silos Therapeutics called Trialos, uh, that's not open for enrollment right now. And, and somebody asked um, asked us to tell tell them about uh, Trialos because um, it, it works on autophagies. Yeah. Autophagy, so can you tell us more about autophagy and the new drug? Sure, so autophagy is a, a mechanism that cells have to, um, I mean, it sounds bad, but to kill themselves when they're, when they're damaged. So it's a way of, of um, if, if there's something going wrong in the cell, it kind of turns on and, and gets rid of the problem, but it also gets rid of the cell. So, so and there's, there's a lot of data that autophagy is, is a problematic in people with ALS. So, um, and there's also some genes that cause familiar form that are autophagy pathways. So there's been a lot of interest in, in uh, drugs that target that pathway and um, the trehalose is one of those. 
Great. A few more uh, questions about sites. Yes, there are sites in the Michigan in Michigan as well. Uh, there's three or four, I think. Uh, and so uh, again, they're, they're on our website with all the contact information. Uh, feel free to uh, reach out to our patient navigator also for more updates. And there's a question about which sites will be doing the expanded access. Uh, yes, yeah, so for Biohaven, it's um, uh, Northwestern, Mass General, and um, Duke. And for um, Clean, I believe it's going to be Barrows and Holy Cross Hospital. There's a question about eligibility. If a patient with ALS has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, would they be ineligible for any trials? Not necessarily, no. I think it depends a little bit on, on how stable it is. But if it's if it's stable on medications or treatment, it shouldn't be exclusionary, at least for the drugs in our trials. There might be other trials that maybe there is a cardiac risk that, that you wouldn't be able to be part of, but um, it's not a blanket. No, we can't be in the trials. There's a question about minimizing placebos and, and, and whether it's possible to stop having placebos at some point. I hope so. I think... Um, and, and that's one of the talks we want to have here of, of, of why do we need them and what can we do to get rid of them. And I think um, what we're lacking in the field is, um, is something like a biomarker. If you, if you think of like cancer trials, your drug either shrinks the tumor or it doesn't shrink the tumor. You kind of see it. You have this beautiful biomarker. And then sometimes you don't need placebos. But in ALS, we don't have something like that. But there's tons of people working on that. And I think discovering that type of biomarker could be a game changer as far as getting rid of uh, placebos. Yeah, we have a couple uh, last two questions. Um, one question about the EAP or expanded access program. Who pays for EAPs? Yeah, so EAPs are paid by uh, different sources. So um, the EAPs we're doing have been largely philanthropy covered um, for and the, and the drug donated by the company. And then there are some parts of it that you can charge to insurance, like the safety labs or the maybe the doctor's visits. There's there's a more uh, flexible rules about that. So it's kind of a mixture of insurance, philanthropy, and the company. For the larger EAPs, like when a drug is already past phase three and maybe wait waiting for market approval, often the company pays for it. Great. Question about the different trial. Uh, can you comment on the Ataxin two trial? Yeah, I think this is a really important target. There's a lot of really great science that lowering a taxin to this particular protein, um, at least in, in cell-based and animal-based models, might protect motor neurons and, and help ax, uh, the motor axons grow. So Biogen uh, has a, a gene therapy approach to lower a taxin 2 that is for all patients with ALS, whether or not you have um, any changes in that gene or sporadic ALS. We think it's involved in everyone. It's a very early phase trial. It's like first in man or woman. So they're, they're um, doing different doses in small groups. But I think the biology is, is very uh, exciting. Great. I think we, uh, we answered all the questions that we have received. Um, and, and certainly we look forward to the next um, update. Next week, we have um, uh, the webinar with uh, Biohaven and all the scientists who developed uh, Verdiprostat. And then the following week, Zeluco plan with UCB uh, investigators. I hope to see many of you back and spread the word. Thank you for joining us. Great. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.